Hello, my name is Sora. I'm going to be touching upon a brief history of real-time multiplayer and the previous forms of multiplayer that we've had up until what we currently have right now with online multiplayer. So let's just start simple. Um, how do video games work? Video games are an interesting medium in which it's one of the few mediums out there that allowed the user to directly interact with the medium in which they're consuming. Um, and most of the times in video games, um, the interaction is usually done through a device that records inputs like a controller, sometimes a microphone, you know, keyboard and mouse. Most video games do this by constantly looping or polling um, said external devices for updates in which the signals are being sent. If you're pressing a certain key, then the game will take the appropriate actions. I've included like a small sample script in Unity written in C Sharp to obtain um, movement, typically on the X and Y axis for a 2D game uh, with like A and D or the arrow keys, for example. So in single player games, uh, it's pretty easy. The game is hosted on your device, and like I said, the device pulls um, the external devices, the peripheries, for um, inputs, and depending on the inputs, the game takes the appropriate actions. So the biggest delay between you uh, using the peripheral, like pressing a button or something, the biggest delay is the time it takes for the signal to be sent from your periphery to the computer or the device that you're playing. Since most peripheries are either wireless or sometimes even wired, and you're like within close proximity if you're using wireless, the delay is usually negligible. Um, you probably wouldn't even notice the difference between a wired and a wireless peripheral device, but some people can notice if they're very attentive. So here's a little bit of footage that I got from a game that I play. I included a little overlay so you can see which buttons I'm pressing and the appropriate actions that the game takes uh, when I pressed said buttons. Okay, so what about multiplayer? If multiple people want to play a game, what? Uh, how do you do that? Uh, the simplest form of multiplayer is local multiplayer, in which the device that you're playing on will pull and take inputs from multiple devices, and typically in local multiplayer it will split the screen into segments uh, to kind of give like an illusion that there are multiple instances of the game running, but in reality it's just one game environment with um, multiple perspectives being played out at the same time, being controlled by multiple people on multiple peripheral devices. So like popular game genres that take advantage of this are like couch co-op games, um, certain first person shooters like the example that I gave in Halo, Call of Duty, Minecraft was a pretty big example of split screen local multiplayer. Um, nowadays split screen multiplayer is not as common mainly because you have to be within the same physical space and uh, being able to play over the internet and online is just a lot more convenient. So what do you want to do if you want to play with multiple people but you don't want your screen divided up because those divisions can get pretty small. When it's four people you're working with one quarter of a screen. So the solution to that was land environments. Um, land environments were um, an environment in which multiple devices are gathered within the same physical space and connected through a multitude of ways. The most popular way is through Ethernet, where you uh, plug in your each of your computers into a central modem or router, and that allows the computers to send pa packets uh, to each other through the central hub. Um, LANs were pretty popular. Back in the day, LAN parties um, used to be held a lot. Um, the only time you really see LAN nowadays is in internet cafes throughout Europe. Um, I don't think internet cafes, cafes are very popular here in the United States, though. So after LAN comes online multiplayer, thanks to the internet, everyone's favorite thing. 
Um, thanks to the internet, you're no longer really required to be in the same physical space like you did with local split-screen multiplayer and LAN multiplayer because now um, data packets can be sent through the internet to other sides of a city, a state, country, or even the world. And online multiplayer is split into two subdivisions, one being peer-to-peer -peer connections and the other being a connection to a dedicated server. First, I'm going to talk about peer-to-peer. Peer-to-peer is a type of network structure in which players directly connect to each other's devices, but there's also two types of peer-to-peer -peer connections in video games. So the two types of peer-to-peer -peer, um, don't really have official names, so I've dubbed them hosting and shared load. Um, in hosting, one player acts as the host of the game environment, and they kind of act as a pseudo-server in which all the other players have their devices connected to their main device, and they relay information from all the other computers to the host's computer, the host's computer processes that information and then sends the data back out again. In the shared load model, each player will connect to each other in like a more of a web formation and each computer shares the, lo the computational load between them. And instead of all the computers communicating with one central computer, all the computers communicate amongst themselves, sending and receiving data from each of the other computers. I believe that the more popular form is the hosting peer-to-peer, -peer, and that does require you to have a decent uh, connection and NAT type that I'm not going to get into. So on the other side, there is the dedicated server, also called the client-server networking architecture. It is where all the players in a game connect to one a uh, server that runs the game's internal environment, keeps track of where all the players are, does all the computations and all the stuff in there. Um, the advantages of having a dedicated server is that typically they have higher computational power than your normal computer that you would be playing the game on, and because they're usually backed by like big companies, they, aff they can afford to have increased security, firewalls, uh, stuff to prevent DDoS attacks, and um, since your information has to be sent through the internet, the time it takes for the data to make a trip from your computer to the server back to your computer is called latency, and that causes a lot of problems. But a brief overview that is heavily simplified is that the server simulates and updates the game state every blank milliseconds. Depends on the server, depends on the game. The intervals are called sometimes called ticks, and the server pulls the users for an input every tick. And the input from the server, or the player, is carried to the server, which simulates the changes within the game state between the last tick and this most recent tick, and then pushes the updated game state back to the client's end to be displayed on their monitors or whatever. So the game is run both locally on each person's computer as well as the server. Some computations are done on the client side, the smaller minute details that don't um, impact the overall gameplay, but the most important calculations that must stay standard across all player sides are done on the server. Problems arise because of the time it takes for our computers to communicate with the servers, and that latency causes a disconnect between our version of the game running on our client side and what the server sees and on their side and this is true for all players who are playing the game pretty much everyone is playing on their own little version of the game that is communicating with the server and the server's job is to try to minimize the variations and the deviations between everyone's different versions to try to make it as seamless as possible so the example I gave on a previous slide would work out as the following. If the user had a ping of 150 milliseconds, the user would press a button, the button press would be sent to the server, the server would process it, simulate it within the game state, and then send it back to the client with a round trip of 150 milliseconds. So the time between 
the user pressing the button and then them seeing the action that the button does would be 150 milliseconds in this case. However small that might be, it could cause the game to feel unresponsive and unnatural. And obviously, as your ping increases, the offness, unnaturalness of that delay gets even worse. The two ways that I have researched to show you how to deal with this are input prediction and lag compensation. So in input prediction, instead of waiting for the data to make a round trip back to you before you start moving, the game takes the input from your keyboard and mouse or whatever your peripheral device is and then does its own computations locally to update your position. And then the next ping to the server, the server checks, hey, you should be at x equals 5, y equals 9. Are you at x equals 5, y equals 9 locally? Yes? Good. No changes need to be done. If you're slightly off, the server will snap you into the correct position that you're supposed to be in. Repeated mismatches in predictions is called rubber banding in the gaming sphere, I guess. And I will show a quick clip of it um, following this next sentence. An input prediction only works for the local client because um, it makes the computations and the predictions based off of the input from your peripheral devices, and thus input prediction cannot be used to predict the movement of other players because you don't know what buttons they're pressing. So client side on the left, server side on the right. There's a little bit of rubber banding right there. I'll play it one more time for you to see, but I want you to pay attention to how the client side is always a little bit ahead of the server side. And there's rubber banding right there. And this clip was taken at a latency of 35 milliseconds. So lag compensation is a little hard for me to explain, but I'm gonna do, it my, do my best with just this picture. Basically, Lag compensation works by the following. Whenever you send an input to the server, it comes with a little timestamp of what tick your input was received at. And when the server does its um, calculations and its simulation of the game state, it kind of not rewinds time, but it checks to see what happened at that moment in the game state. So in the picture provided, there was a very bad latency of 200 milliseconds. And so you can see the player model on the left, and then you see these little blocky outlines on the right. The red blocks is where the player model was on the client's end 200 milliseconds ago. And then the blue is the confirmed location that that player was 200 not actually 200 milliseconds ago but 200 milliseconds plus the whatever delay whatever and so the lag compensation traces back the game state to when that shot was shot and you see the hitboxes and you see that the crosshair is within the hitbox and thus there is a blood splatter confirming that the shot hit uh, and these are the sources that I used. Um, all in all, the um, it go a lot of work goes into making sure that things are as accurate and as real time as possible. Multiplayer games have come a long way from just like turn based. Here you take the controller. Okay, my turn. Give the controller back. It's mind blowing to see how hundreds of people can be in the same game across the world and seeing more or less the same thing and having a smooth experience. There's a lot of logistics behind it. This is extremely oversimplified, but I hope you guys could just get a little bit more of appreciation for multiplayer games and all the work that goes into making them successful.